Okay, good. All right, well, I guess I'll get started. Uh, so the plan for today is that uh, I'll talk for a little while. I don't know how long exactly, to be honest with you. I, uh, I thought it was just going to be for an hour, but I, I might have prepared too much stuff to say. Um, or not, uh, it could be. Uh, I'll talk for a little while and then Peter will take over and he'll start talking more properly about stratified things. Um, so the stuff I'm going to be talking about is kind of a prelude to the stratified stuff. It's supposed to be part of motivation, but it's also going to be trying to set up a certain number of problems that are going to appear later on. Um, and so I'm going to be going from there. So uh, so remember what, the, what our little motto was. Our motto was that, that when you have a, a class of geometric objects that we're interested in, uh, the strategy is to, to try to understand a certain category of sheaves attached to them. And then when you think about the functor that turns your geometric object to your categories, that carries your geometric object to the category of sheaves that you're interested in, and then, then you're going to try and represent that functor. And that, that representation, that they're representing object there, is going to be the homotopy type. So sheaves will determine a homotopy type. And then, well, since you've represented a functor, uh, the homotopy type uh, will recover the sheaves. And so that was the little motto that we were carrying around with us yesterday. And we looked at a lot of examples of that phenomenon. Uh, and I'm going to look at some more examples of that phenomenon. We've mostly so far, and in the next couple minutes, we've mostly been focusing on what you might call the, the Galoisian style duality, where you're thinking about things of uh, sheaves of nonlinear things, sheaves of sets or sheaves of spaces. Uh, but I'm also going to today talk about what happens when you start to think about sheaves of linear things. And that gets you into the sort of Tanakhian formalism. So I want to talk about that. So first of all, before I go any further, uh, what questions might have been left over from last time? There's at least one that uh, Aaron Mays LG brought up that I want to address in a minute, but uh, are there any other questions that people had? I mean, I have a stupid question. I don't know if it's yet relevant, but so in the sort of uh, non pro finite version of the story, so sort of like the version that's in the Ayala, Francis, and Rosenblum paper. Yeah. Um, uh, are you allowed to stratify over any post sets, or do you still restrict to sort of finite ones, or or what? What's the deal with that? Uh, there are restrictions, right, David? David Ayala is here, so he can probably do a better job of answering this than me. Yeah, and that in that setup, those stratified objects were they have like. Uh, relevant point set topology to them. Uh, you know, they're, they're some version of singular manifolds and they're, they're defined inductively. And so I don't have a description of what the underlying stratifying post sets are just outright, but they do have an assortment of features to them, namely that they're downward closed or sorry, downward finite. Downward uh, finite. And, yeah, and that... it, it, they all have that feature. And they also have the feature that they're. Um, well, anyway, yeah, they, they have that. All right, thanks. Um, maybe one other thing to say, well, I mean, it's something that I'll eventually say, but like in the, in the sort of classification theorem for constructible sheaves that Lurie writes in higher algebra, you need the, uh -oh. froze. Peter got frozen. I, I, I could try and predict what he was going to say. Uh, I don't actually know, but uh, if uh... still frozen. Oh no, no you're, you're, you're unfrozen now. Oh, okay, okay. So um, I mean, I'll say this later, um, but but I mean, like in what Jacob proves in Appendix A of Higher Algebra for this sort of classification theorem, one of the things you need is for the poset to satisfy the ascending chain condition. So that's a restriction. Mm -hmm. The descending chain condition. Uh, yeah, des descending. Oh. Okay, how Jacob phrases it in higher algebra, I think it was the ascending. But I mean, it's just the kind of convention. Uh, so that, down finite, of course, implies that uh, descending chain condition. But the descending chain condition is more general, such as the underlying post set of spec Z. 
Yeah, one thing that I'm constantly worried about with this descending, I keep getting confused about this. So, so uh, the condition that, uh, so I thought it was called an Ethereum-ness, uh, which was an ascending chain condition. Well, so this is interesting. So like certainly what Jacob writes in higher algebra is the ascending chain condition. Right. That's the one that I thought was relevant. Is that wrong? Well, that's what's written in higher algebra. <laughs> Okay. Well, so I could say exactly why I thought uh, why I thought that was the relevant one. Um, in fact, it's it's my next slide. Um, so uh, so Aaron Maisel G asked which posets are sober, and I I kind of hemmed and hawed a little bit and said, well, the finite ones certainly are. And then there was a little bit of discussion, but I think I was a little vague about what the what the actual answer was. So I thought I'd actually try to give the correct answer. Um, in the form of this theorem, which is that uh, a poset is sober if and only if it is an Ethereum. By which I mean that it satisfies the ascending chain condition. So that's the theorem. Uh, so that's, that's why, uh, for example, if you're thinking about posets and you're thinking about sheaves on posets, uh, you might want to contemplate uh, Ethereum ones as opposed to more general ones. Oh, uh, so by the way, I, I think maybe the the reason that you have a an ascending versus descending condi uh, chain condition um, is because uh, the um, the sort of uh, way that you guys form the Alexandra topology, or at least you guys and Jacob, is different from a. Di there's another convention where you just do it the opposite way somehow. Yeah, but uh, I think. And you declare the opens to be the closed and vice versa. And so yeah, then. Right. I was worried about that. But uh, well, anyway. Yeah. Um, so, but right. So for us, remember, how, how does it work? For us, a closed is a sieve. So it's something that's, that's downwardly closed, as they say. So if P and Q are both elements of your closed, that, or, sorry, if, if P and Q are elements of your poset, and P is less than or equal to Q, and Q is in your closed subset, then P has to be as well. That's the condition that I'm going to give for closedness. Yeah, I, I was just mentioning this because uh, when we when we studied uh, exodromy at, at Regensburg, uh, some of the people there were confused because they were familiar with the opposite convention. So, I so there are, there are two conventions floating around, I guess. I guess I've never seen the other one, but okay. All right. Uh, I mean, I, obviously I've seen it. I can just take the off, but uh, you know what I mean? Um, anyway, so let's let, uh, let let me let me set about proving this theorem to try and explain why Ethereum this is a good idea. So Sorry, my internet cut out just as you were saying this. Um, oh yeah, Ethereum is ascending chain or descending chain condition. It's ascending chain. Okay, thanks. Uh, how do you spell ascending? There we go. So uh, actually, why don't I say a little more? So uh, I'll go up here. So if you've got a sequence, you know, S0, S1, dot, 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 uh, it will have to stabilize. But any such chain does that. That's the same as saying that if you have a subset uh, inside there, that it has a maximal element. Right, those are the same sentence. So, uh, so all subsets have a max element. Uh, have a maximal element. Of course, it doesn't have to be unique. Okay. So I'm going to use, uh, I'm, my claim is that Netherian, this is the same thing as sobriety. Um, so I'm going to try and prove that. So if you've got a post set, first of all, just by having a post set, you're automatically a Kolmogorov topological space. So you don't have to worry about the uniqueness of the generic points. It's just enough to locate a generic point. So that if it, the, the goal is to show that if, if if you have an Ethereum post set, then for every irreducible closed, uh, you can locate a generic point. And you don't even have to worry right now about whether or not it's unique, that'll be automatic. Okay, so that's the first thing. Okay, and so now I'm gonna try and prove that. Um, and so, uh, well, suppose that I've got myself an Ethereum post set. And suppose that I've got myself an irreducible closed. Um, 
then uh, I'll just select, because I can, a maximal element of that subset, right? I'm using the Noetherianness to choose this. I'll call that thing uh, uh, little z. Uh, so I'll just choose such a thing. And then, well, if I look at z and I look at the closure of little z, then, you know, I might have missed some stuff. So whatever that stuff is, I'll just look at the closures of all those pieces as well. And I'll just union them all up. Now, arbitrary unions of closed things are closed inside one of these Alexandrov topologies. So this is a union, this is a description of Z as a union of a closed piece and another closed piece. But if this is an irreducible thing, then, uh, then, then it has to be the case that there isn't, that this piece here doesn't actually exist at all. Right, because it's irreducible. Irreducible means that you can't write it in a non-trivial fashion as a union of proper closed subsets. So that means that this other piece had, must actually have already been contained in the closure of little z. So that means that little z was in fact a generic point. Right. Conversely, if you have a sober topological space, so if you've got P and P is sober, then uh, if you've got one of these sequences, I'm going to try and prove that this thing has to stabilize, that this sequence S has to stabilize. So what will I do? Well, again, I'm going to take the closure of S, and that's irreducible. Uh, uh, why is it irreducible? Well, it's irreducible because you know there isn't any proper subset that can be that that can it can't be written as a union of proper subsets of proper closed subsets. So it has to have a generic point T, but that generic point has to show up somewhere on my list because if it didn't, then I'd have something that was bigger than it and that's obviously not possible. And so that shows you that actually Noetherianness and sobriety are actually the same thing. Is everybody happy with that? Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks a lot. So post-sets so post say that Noetherianness and sobriety are the same thing. By the way, if you have a post-set, uh, I didn't write this down, but I'll just tell you in words. Uh, if you have a post set that isn't uh, Netherian, and so you're trying to consider sheaves on it, um, you you can fix it up, right? We had this soberfication procedure, and it turns out that that always gives you another post set, um, and that other post set that you end up with is uh, you can think of it as the post set of ideals inside your original post set, with what's called the Scott topology. So. Uh, if you ever have to soberify your, your uh, post set, that's how you do that. Okay, so that was one of so the leftovers. What, yeah. Well, so what does that do with like the natural numbers? Uh, just the minimal non Ethereum thing? Uh, so let's see. So with the natural numbers, let me see if I can get this right. Uh, let me just make sure I'm going to say the right thing here. Yeah, so with the natural numbers, what you get is you get the, um, you're getting the, the uh, what shall I say, you're getting the upwardly closed uh, sets as your, as your new points. Right, but that seems like it's just the natural numbers again. Well, no, I mean, there are other upwardly closed subsets. Well, no, sorry, there aren't uh, uh, other upwardly closed subsets. Um, I guess relatedly, what are sheaves on, on the natural numbers as a post set? Right, uh, it, it's the same question. So, but, uh, so let's see, let me see if I can do this fairly here. Um, just give me a second. So right, so Aaron asks what the, let me just do this correctly here. I feel like there are no non-trivial open covers, uh, so the sheaf condition may be vacuous. Um, what am I saying that's wrong here? Uh, yeah, is it point? Is that the soberification? I beg your pardon? Is it, to Aaron's comment, uh, just there, his suggestion that it's point, the soberification. So am, Wait, I, am I recalling correctly, so soberfication is supposed to be a universal thing such that sheaves are the same. Yeah, I, uh, I don't think it's soberfication should be a point. 
And I, I, I guess, I'm not sure, but I think that pre-sheaves on the natural, or sorry, sheaves on natural numbers are the same as pre-sheaves. Yeah, yeah. So that I believe. Uh, yeah, and then the, the, sober, this, the, the associated post that's just gonna be the points of that topos. And so these are like sort of probe systems or whatever, somehow something like that. And then, yeah. But let's see, what am I missing here? So you, okay, so you asked about the soberfication of the natural numbers, right? And the- uh, So we know this should be a, an Ethereum post set in the end. This I claim will be an Ethereum post set, but in any case, it's a topological space. And one of the opens, what are the points of that topological space? They're exactly the irreducible close of the original set of natural numbers. Right, that was the construction we did last time. Right. And those are, but the uh, irreducible closed, uh, I think those are just all the closed subsets, which are. Well, and then there's one all of more. The down or... Oh. There's one more point that is the, that is everything, right? The whole thing mm -hmm. is irreducible as well. Mm hmm. And the whole thing doesn't ah, have yes. a generic point. So I think, okay, good. So I'm glad we're having this conversation. So I think what's going to happen here is that we're going to end with N union infinity. So maybe this is what David was saying was that there, you're adding on a new, he was telling right. us what the new point was and there's only one. But the post set structure on that, I, I pause at. Uh, what's the post set structure? I think it's just containment. Or like the, the usual inequality? Yeah, I think it's the usual inequality. Like the, everything is less than not infinity. Every, not every ascending chain stabilizes. Not every ascending chain stabilizes. That's right. So I must still be wrong. Let's figure out what I did wrong. You said we were supposed to think about ideals in the post set. Uh, what notion of ideal are we just, are you referring to? Uh, I hadn't planned on talking about this, so I don't know. Uh, so let's see. So is that, uh, sorry, let me see if I can say this correctly. So uh, making problems. And it ends. Up, it, no, you're not. It's it ends up being the same thing. Yeah, ideal in in the way that I was saying it means that you're looking at an at at. Uh, upwardly closed things that can't be written as an intersection of two uh, non-trivial upwardly closed things. It can't be written as an intersection in a non-trivial way of two upwardly closed things. Right, but that's just dual to looking at the irreducibles. Actually, is it is it a comp some compactification of the natural numbers? You join a new point for every equivalence class of ascending sequence. Um, and then say that two ascending sequences are equivalent if you know they're like well, finally, you know, finally, all but finally agree or something like that. Or there, or, or I don't know. I don't know what the equivalence relation would be. You know. So then, given a sequence, an ascending sequence of the natural numbers, yeah, that doesn't stabilize in the natural numbers. Uh, you have a new point that corresponds to that. Something like that. But, but the sequence itself doesn't. No. Stick. Yeah, that's wrong. Like if we. That's wrong. Yeah. Like it can't. I mean, Netherianness is detected by injections from the natural numbers. Yeah, that's right. So somehow, it, like it should also be like a quotient. Or... Yeah, I, I, I don't. Yeah, totally. It, so it doesn't seem like the map from the natural numbers will be injected, is what you're saying, right, Aaron? I think like it cannot. It, it I, I assert. Yeah, it, as a post -set. Artinianus exactly. is exactly the the, the non-existence of injections from the natural yep. as a post -set, yeah. But I, I yeah. guess I don't, I, I'm still having trouble with that because it seems to me that if you have something that is already T0 and you soberify it, then, the, then that has to be an injection, right? Right, I mean, what I'm saying is, is that, that if X is T0, 
this is a topological space. Mm -hmm. And you map over to the soberfication of it. I think that needs to be an injection, don't you think? I, I don't feel I can speak to that. I don't have a good sense of T0. Well, the, the house dwarfification is not, does not have that feature. No, it doesn't, is, but it's not the, I'm not looking it, at the house dwarfification. That's right. But, uh, I've got a dumb question. Why does X sub have to be Alexandrov? Well, uh, it, it, it doesn't, and I, I said it was, but maybe I'm just wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think that's the issue. And Maybe like, I was just wrong. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. And Maybe then else. since it, then, if it's not Alexandrov, then you just don't have a problem. It's like it's some topological space. I must have been wrong. Yeah, so I, I apologize. I yeah, I think this Scott topology thing isn't. Oh, quite... oh, oh, right. Yes, thank you. That's right. The whole point of what I was saying a second ago was that that uh, that it's it's the it's a different topology. Sorry. Damn it. <laughs> I'm really sorry. The the whole point was that I said that you get a new topo you get a new post set, but it's not a uh, it's not the sorry. This has not got the Alexandrov topology. <laughs> so then, what does it even mean to have a post set? Well, but the point is, is that there's a different topology that you can put on post sets like this, which is called the Scott topology. Okay. Yeah, that that's exactly the topology on the like you have a post set of points like of the topos and then the scott topology is that right topology that's precisely it's defined so that that happens so i so, no, I'm, i can't I generate see. for you the, the definition uh as a post set of the scott topology right now uh but, well, but i mean just in terms of types is that something that applies to any post set or certain post sets or post sets with structure uh, it's it's like all categories or something. I mean, so the yeah, I think it how you can poses. define the Scott topology on a post set is you declare the open sets to be the things that are both upwardly closed. So that's one condition and inaccessible by directed joins. So that means that if you have a directed set uh, with some supremum, um, or how, how do I say this? So if all directed sets with supremum in your thing that's supposed to be open have non-empty intersection with O, with your thing that's supposed to be open. Um, so I mean, it's a somewhat technical uh, condition, but I think it basically it's, um, it's to get, I mean, in, in some sense it's to, you know, fix up this thing about, you know, ascending chain conditions. Right. Is it, this is, this, I feel like this is like saying that it's upwardly closed and do I want to say filtered? Uh, is that the same yeah, thing? So yeah, it's if, yeah, so you need all directed sets with supremum in this set to also intersect the set. It also has to intersect this set. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, so, so a directed subset, meaning just like a totally ordered sub. A totally ordered subset. Full, yeah. full sub post set. That's right. If yeah. the supremum okay. is contained in, in this open, in this putatively open set, then uh -huh. in some element of it will also have to be in this putatively open set. Ah, uh, okay. So, so then to Thanks, the natural Peter. numbers. Great. Yeah. Okay. Good. I resolved the contradiction. I hope. So yeah, so it's this it's this other goofy topology that I I honestly I've I've only thought about it uh, long enough to say the sentence I said a second ago. So, <laughs> um. so inaccessible by joints. That's the that's the condition that Peter just named regarding totally ordered. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Great. That's okay. what that means. I see. Um, so if you're upwardly, if you're directed set stabilizes, of course, there's no condition. That's right. So the only issue is for the non-stabilizing ones. That's right. Uh, those, the, the ones that are unbounded. Right. You buy that? So, so then it's that, it's, it's the natural numbers union a maximal element with this new topology? With this new topology, yeah. Cool. 
yeah, I'll, I'll think about that, but that, that sounds promising. And now that new element is actually, is actually a generic point for this, this structure, right? Right, yeah, as it should be. As it should be. Cool. Okay, well, thanks a lot for the detour, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate it. That's it. So no, I, mean, I, I realize these post sets are actually arising for us in a lot of places, especially when we start to think about Ron spaces and the like. So it's probably worthwhile to actually get this right. Um, and uh, I think, uh, Peter, have you thought about this in more detail? Do you? The Scott topology thing? Yeah. Uh, not really. I mean, th there's something to mention sort of later. I mean, there's a Besides the sobriety, there's a, another reason why this uh, ascending chain condition comes up in the, the constructible chief stuff in higher algebra, which mm -hmm. is basically there's a, you need a certain convergence problem because you're equating two things and like right. one of them is obviously Posnikov complete and then the other one, I mean, a priori no. And, you know, if your poset is, doesn't satisfy the ascending chain condition, you could create some example where you would have a Postnikov tower that doesn't converge basically. And, uh, right. um, but I mean, we'll say more about that later. So if, if that didn't make sense, which I, <laughs> you know, then please ignore it <laughs> for now. Well, it made sense to me, but that's because I know what you're going to say. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, is, is everybody happy with this diversion? Yeah. It's, it, there's this other topology. That's the point that I should have made. Sorry, I got a little confused there. Okay, uh, so to continue, so last time we, we constructed a, a pro space or a pro infinity groupoid or a pro anima, whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, uh, we could do this for, for, any, uh, for any topos capital X here. We could define this pro space. And the idea was, well, uh, what are we going to do? We're going to look at the category of spaces. That's the that's the the last stop in the world of of infinity topoi. It's the terminal thing. So then I can look at the global sections of that thing, and then I sorry I can look at the global sections of the constant sheaf of that thing. Right? I can look at the global sections of the constant sheaf of that thing, and that defines for you a pro space. Um, and uh, we did some work. Uh, in sort of a, uh, a less exotic situation where we were just working with topoi rather than infinity topoi, one topoi that is to say, and we analyzed this pretty closely in that case. Uh, and we saw that, for example, it was very closely related with the pi zero of your favorite topological space, assuming your topological space was something nice like a CW complex. Um, and so it, accordingly, if, uh, if you do this thing, if you construct this pro-infinity groupoid and you uh, try to apply it to the category of sheaves of spaces on your favorite CW complex, then you're going to reconstruct the actual homotopy type of your CW complex. Right? So the idea here is that if you look at all sheaves of spaces, uh, on, uh, on your favorite uh, CW complex, then you can use this construction, this pro-infinity pro groupoid, to reconstruct the homotopy type of your space. Right? And so this is the very strong sense in which uh, uh, sheaves actually determine a homotopy type for you. So uh, another example that we didn't talk about last time is uh, this one, which is a situation in which you might have a scheme so you might have a scheme uh, and uh, you might be interested in its at all topos, right? And you can run this precise same construction. There's no danger whatsoever. And what you get is called the at all homotopy type. So the at all homotopy type was uh, invented uh, in, uh, well, I don't know, at some point in the 1960s uh, by Artman and Mazur with a, a rather different looking definition from this. Here we're kind of using a lot of the power that we have at our disposal uh, from higher category theory. Uh, but uh, this Art and Mazur homotopy type uh, allowed you to describe a higher, not just pi one of a scheme, but also a higher pi i of a scheme. And so this is sometimes uh, what's denoted, oops, oh, I see. Uh, 
This is sometimes what's denoted uh, phi i et of your favorite scheme. So let me give you a couple sub-examples of this. Uh, let's do some, some sub-examples of this. So let's suppose that your x is spec k. So k is here just going to be a field. And you look at this thing. Well, so in this case, uh, the, the higher pi i's, the higher at all homotopy groups of this x, I'm just going to write k here, um, they're, they're all zero if, uh, if i is bigger than, than one. Um, but if i is equal to one, uh, then you actually get something new. And that something new is, of course, something old. It's just your friend, the uh, absolute Galois group. of your field. So in the same way that, uh, uh, you know, the absolute, you know, it, I don't know, if, uh, I don't know if this is a familiar yoga for everybody, but I, I, I always think of, of uh, Galois theory as really being, a, you know, a form of covering space theory for things that look like spec Ks. And this is an instantiation of that phenomenon. Uh, and of course, we know we, we don't have any higher homotopy here. So it's not, you know, the homotopy type is kind of overkill for this example. We could have gotten away with just thinking about finite at all covers. Um, so that's, that's nice. Uh, but you do get interesting homotopy types. So for example, if you take uh, uh, a scheme X over the complex numbers, and let's say it's a finite type scheme, uh, then, you know, you can attach to this thing one of these uh, et al. homotopy types. So I'm allowed to look at the et al. homotopy type of this thing. And, well, uh, I, I should say here that the, you know, a pro-infinity groupoid is quite an abstract object. Um, Pro-infinity groupoids are these, you know, it's the pro category of what's already quite a big category, the infinity category of spaces. So taking the pro category of that just gives you this gigantic thing that's really hard maybe to, uh, to comprehend. Um, in particular, I don't know uh, the invariance that I know of uh, pro spaces are insufficient to uh, to identify equivalences of pro spaces. Do you mean that you can't detect equivalences on pro homotopy groups? That's right, and I don't have a I don't have a replacement for the pro homotopy groups that would that would solve that issue. <laughs> Can you identify the localization at the pi star equivalences? You absolutely know that I can. <laughs> yes, I can. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, this is my job. To, to <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> hey, question, yeah. Peter. <laughs> yes, yeah, so there's a, uh, you can look instead, so if I go back for a second, if you look instead here, this is a, uh, uh, this, this functor here that I've written down, um, this is a, a left exact accessible functor from spaces to spaces, right? And, uh, and the problem is, is the source in some sense. You're taking the source, which is the category of all spaces, and you're adding on limits to it in a universal fashion, inverse limits, that is to say. But, uh, you know, you might object that that's a big category to start with. Um, for example, uh, one thing that you're doing there is you're, you're tacking on sort of uh, the limits of the Posnikov towers of a space. But you don't need to do that formally. You might as well just, you know, take the limit that's already happening for you inside the category of spaces. If I take the limit of a Posnikov tower inside the category of spaces, that's giving me a good limit already. So maybe I should just consider that one. So that's exactly what I can do. I can now look instead here at S less than or equal, or less than infinity. So this is the category of truncated spaces, spaces whose homotopy vanishes after some finite stage. And then I can look at this composite here. And now that's a left exact accessible functor from truncated spaces to spaces. And so this thing deserves the name of a pro, of a pro truncated space. So this is a pro truncated space. And now, uh, Peter, I need your help here because I, I need to remember the right notation. Do you write this? 
Yeah, that's what I write. Okay, so Peter writes this, so I will too. So the point here is that a space mapping to its Posnikov tower is no longer an equivalence when you've freely adjoined inverse limits. Yeah, not, yeah. yeah exactly. It's, uh, it, you've just added on this sort of new formal one just for fun, um, just because uh -huh. you felt like being perverse. So, yeah, let's, so and, let's agree that that's a perversity and, <laughs> and not do that. Uh, Peter, yeah, am I recalling so, correctly, you asserted to me at some point that maybe the better notion is these protruncated ones? Or yeah. just like that's what everyone uses in, yeah. in actuality, so, that's what's being referred to. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, maybe there are two things to say. I mean, first, anything that anyone has ever said about the etal homotopy type was about its protruncation. Yeah. I mean, even um, the like model structures, when people, you know, work in, have, you know, more classically worked with some sort of model categories, essentially they were always working um, with this protruncated version. Or um, another thing to just a uh, new literature reference in this like Art and Mazer stuff, they call this the natural symbol from music isomorphisms, like the, the pi the star things that you isomorph. invert to get this, okay, yeah. So. Yeah, which is like, uh, well, yeah. Maybe not the best name. So natural, but, uh, natural isomorphisms. Yeah. Um, are equivalents are isomorphisms on the on all these on, not all these pro space these pro groups that show up as pi i's. Yeah. The other the other thing maybe to say is that um, I mean, sort of as Clark uh, alluded to, there are two there are two fully faithful embeddings of spaces into pro spaces. One that's like the unit embedding that like regard your pro object as a constant thing. Um, and then there's a second one, which is send your space to its Posnikov tower. And those agree for truncated spaces, but in, in general, they, they don't agree. Um, and so th this kind of, yeah, a bit weird. Uh, yeah. But they become the same after inverting this protruncation or inverting pi star isomorphism. That's right. So this is this this the the act of oh, just to emphasize this point the act of restricting back to here to the truncated spaces is the same as inverting these pi star isomorphisms. Right. So inverting these pi star isomorphisms, or if you like these natural isomorphisms, is the same thing as. Uh, just restricting to the category, restricting your pro objects to the category of truncated spaces. Right, so these are two ways of saying the same thing. And so that now gives you a much more plausible looking uh, uh, homotopy type attached to this thing. In particular, it has the property that it can be controlled by understanding algebraic invariants that we can write down, you know, homotopy groups and cohomology groups and things. There's a further restriction that you can do. Actually, maybe to write this down, maybe what I'll do is, uh, uh, what am I doing? I have a page below, there we go. Uh, is I will look at this. So you've got, uh, you've got spaces going to spaces and this is your pro object, right? So here's your pro space. Uh, if you look at the truncated things sitting inside here, then this way you get a protruncated space. And this is the place where the two inclusions that Peter was describing of spaces into pro spaces, either as the limit of its Postikoff tower or just as the representable, uh, those things coincide here for the protruncated spaces. You could do something even smaller. You could look at the pi finite spaces. These are the spaces that are truncated and their homotopy groups or sets are all finite, right? So these are the pi finite spaces. And this gives you a profinite space. So here with these things, with these things from S pi, the homotopy groups are actually all profinite groups. They're not just pro sets, but they're even profinite sets. Um, so that means that they're a little more familiar to uh, you know, to us. <laughs> you know, I mean, a, a random pro set looks like a uh, quite a scary object, but a pro finite set is something that, that, you know, we have a good 
way to conceive of. And so some people prefer, uh, me being one of them to some extent, uh, prefer to think about these guys here. So, okay, so what does that mean? So that means that, well, what I did was I wrote down uh, something that I was calling pi infinity uh, et of my favorite scheme x. I had this atoll homotopy type attached to x. Now this is quite an uh, abstract object. You can make it more concrete, i.e. you can understand it up to equivalence uh, by looking at this version that Peter taught me to call pi less than or equal to infinity. This is a protruncated space attached to x. It's not itself truncated, it's just protruncated. Oh, sorry, those are not equal. Uh, this is a localization of the previous one, so I guess the map goes this way. Or I can go further and I can profinitely complete. So I guess I write a hat on this usually. Sorry, I feel confused. Profinite space to me feels like it's supposed to be like an inverse limit of finite spaces. And so yep. I would expect the finiteness to be on the target. Um, no, it should be in the source, right? Because what's happening is that you're embedding your category, whatever it is, say pi finite spaces into uh, a larger category. Okay. Which is the category of all functors from there to there that preserve uh, whatever they preserve. Uh, in this case, uh, suitably filtered co-limits and uh, finite limits. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah, so and, maybe... and so this will enact profinite completion um, in, the, in the usual sense of like, homotopy groups? That's right. That's exactly right. So if I have a protruncated okay. space and I uh, restrict to, and I, and I regard it as a functor that goes in this direction, and I restrict it back to here to S pi, yeah. then that'll give me the profinite completion of my homotopy groups. I see. And then is it right con extension back um, up to S less than infinity and S? Those are the kind of the natural directions of considering these as full subcategories? Yeah, that's right. Um, okay. Uh, of course, you know, in general, that won't be an equivalence anymore, right? You've, you've, you've done something drastic when you restrict it down to pi finite spaces. Oh, there's um, one, one just small comment, which mm -hmm. is that on higher, on higher homotopy groups, profinite completion of a space does not just profinitely complete the homotopy groups. This right, is true sorry. on pi one, and then there's some there's some annoying stuff that happens. You're absolutely so, right. Uh, yeah, this is. Sorry. I mean, I I remember this because I personally run into this uh, confusion many times. And you're right. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I I apologize. You're right. I, what I meant was profinitely completing the space, not necessarily just its homotopy groups. There's a big difference there. You're right. And, and, and actually the, the non-difference, the difference between the two notions has to do with, uh, for example, this idea of being a good group. Um, so for example, if uh, you can take a group and you can take its classifying space and you can try and profinitely complete the classifying space, or you can take the group and profinitely complete that. And the difference between those two uh, answers, uh, if, they're, if they're the same, then that's what's called a good group. And it's a big open problem to see whether or not various groups that you can write down are good. Yeah, like um, mapping class groups of genus G surfaces within marked points uh, is a con very old conjecture that these are good. Yeah. Um, I feel so like pi finite spaces are so weird. I don't know how to, like if I don't believe in taking homotopy classes of maps, how could I characterize those? You know, we're characterizing that as like certain sets. Uh, They're the coherent objects of the topos, infinite topos of spaces. Yeah. Truncated coherent. Truncated coherent. Yeah, truncated coherent. <laughs> if you want just coherent, then you, you nix the truncatedness part. Uh, yeah, so if you... Uh, cool, thank you. Yeah. Um, and that's that's yeah. a procedure that works for any infinity topos. So so if you look at um, if you look at uh, Jacob's section on um, stone duality in uh, in SAG, um, 
like one way to motivate this thing where we're looking at S pi is that uh, when you look at, uh, there's a functor from pro objects on the truncated coherent objects of a topos into topoi over the topos that you started with. Uh, and that's fully faithful. Um, and so in particular, right. uh, okay. this sort of instantiates stone, stone duality, like this, that's sort of exactly what you want. Yeah. So maybe, maybe I'll, I'll say what, I'll say part, I'll say a piece of what Harry just said, since it'll be uh, relevant to us at some point. Uh, so if you look at, at uh, these, uh, I've written it funny, funnily here, but this is, these are the profinite um, spaces. Uh, these actually embed fully faithfully into all topoi. That isn't true if I look at anything bigger. So if I look at S uh, less than infinity, if I look at the protruncated spaces, uh, these map to topoi, but it's not an embedding. Right. So that's one of the reasons why you might want to consider, you know, just the just the coherent piece, just the the, the pi finite piece. Yeah, and for any bounded coherent topos, uh, like there's a version of there's a relative version of this as well. So yeah. where you map into topoi over T. Then. Yeah. But I'm not going to write down the relative version right now. Um, Anyway, why was I bringing this up in the first place? Let me say why I was doing that. Um, uh, the reason I was doing that was that I wanted to be able to say something about uh, if you had a X over C of finite type, then you can look at this at all homotopy type, but I'm just going to consider it's profinite completion. I'm just going to be lazy about this and only think about the profinite completion of this thing. And I can ask, well, what kind of object is that? And in particular, well, if I've got X over C of finite type, then, well, uh, I'm entitled to think, you know, this is a, something that's defined by a bunch of equations, right? I've got a whole collection of equations over the complex numbers, and I can look at the solutions to those equations inside the complex numbers. And that has a natural topology that it will inherit from the ambient uh, space that's sitting around it. That's called the analytic topology. And so that's just a topological space. It's a concrete topological space. And so you can look at its associated homotopy type. Now it's associated homotopy type is a, you know, an honest to God homotopy type. It needn't be profinite. But what I'm allowed to do is I'm allowed to profinitely complete it. And if I do that, then I actually recover this sort of algebraic homotopy type, this thing that comes from just sort of thinking about the pure algebra of those equations and writing those things down. So is there a, a geometric morphism that induces this equivalence? Um, I, I know I always screw this up. I feel like you're asking me this to make me say something stupid. I know you're not, but <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so it right, so there's, there's, it's a two stage thing, right? There's a zigzag here. I look at the analytic topology on this side, and I look at the atal topology on this side, then I look at some kind of intermediate thing. Well, yeah, so, right, so there's, a, there's a geometric morphism from the analytic to the atal thing. Um, but the intermediate thing is for, for the sites. It's, oh, but the sites only, I see, right. That's yeah, right. and basically how, I mean, how, how you see this is using this sort of gaga stuff um, that, Atal covers, you know, sort of on the analytic and and atal sides are basically the same. So you think about sheaves on a topological space, um, you know, from the sort of perspective of local homeomorphisms, not just open subsets. So I ask this really um, because the arrow goes in the opposite direction. Well, if, if that was intended to be an arrowhead on the- Oh yeah, no, yeah, you're right. That's right, I see. Yeah, I should really have written it. That's a fair point, yeah. You're right, I should have said it that way. In fact, yeah, so, through that way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and maybe something that's less fancy than this, that's more familiar, is that there's like, there's a map from X of C and to the Zariski topological space. Um, right. So it, it goes in it, it goes in that direction. 
because those are risky topologies like uh, coarser. Right, that's that, right. That. Uh, so, so let's see. So, do I understand what you're saying here? So, you're saying I look at X of C n and I map it to the Zariski topological space attached to X, right? And uh, and so, let's see. What are you telling me about how this interacts with the Atoll site? Oh, there's a geometric morphism uh, from the. Well, I mean, on the level of sites, it's, it's slightly annoying. Yeah. But, but there's a right. geometric morphism uh, from sheaves on the analytic space to the etal topos, and it sits over the, this is a risky thing. Yeah, so let's, let, let's pass down to the sheaves on these things. So I always like to do the following. I always like to write the sites or the topological space with the superscript and the topoi with the subscript. So I'll write x sub n and x sub czar, and the observation is that this factors through x at. This is the kind of thing that's going to become relevant for us later when we start to stratify, so uh, we'll come back to this. Um, but the point is, is that this map here is the thing that induces an equivalence, this equivalence back here on the shapes. That's the, or the homotopy types. That's the thing that I wanted to say. So, and you said that commutative triangle was was a triangle of um, of topoi. Yeah, this um, is a commutative triangle first. topoi. Okay. Or infinity topoi, if you feel like being infinity, which this is higher categories. It's, yeah. Good. Uh, okay. So are there other questions about this? I, I'm, I'm going to kind of leave this sort of uh, Galoisian duality story and go on to something more, uh, more linear soon. But so was the point that this this morphism of topoi is not induced at the level at like the point set level exactly? Was that kind of what Peter was alluding to? Uh, yeah. So what happens is like normally when you think about sheaves on a topological space, you take you know the category of open subsets, the post set of open subsets. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but the the thing is that there's um, that's not what that's not where it's easy to define the morphism of sites. Right. So the easy thing is like if you have an atoll map, you know, from some scheme y to x. Right. Then you can define, uh, you know, a covering, like a local homeomorphism to X of C and by just taking, by taking the analytic thing on both sides. Yeah. Um, so really, you want to think about like local homeomorphisms over your thing instead of open subsets. Uh, so it it's sort of there's a zigzag. Um, oh, and the, and the and the. The intermediate term is is like the atal site of the topological space. Yeah, it's the atal yeah. site of the topological uh, space, and, yeah, and uh, so the, perhaps those have the same things. sheaves. Yeah, those have like yeah they have the, the same sheaves. sheaves. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, exactly. So, um, so yeah, it's just yeah. In terms of sites, you know, sometimes you have to do this sort of thing because yeah, yeah they're, they're like presentations. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, maybe maybe I have uh, one question. Yeah. You can you compute the uh, etal homotopy type of the integers? Uh, yeah. Um, it, well, it, I mean, I, not right now. I'm not asking. Do you, you want me? To, <laughs> if, if you want a complete proof, it, we need some stuff from later in the course. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I can. I, yeah. So so you wanted to look at spec Z. Is that right? And and uh, yeah, so let's uh, let's have a look here. So I'm going to look again at the pro truncated version of this thing. This is a good example. Um, so you might think, you know, spec Z, that's a very exciting scheme. It's got all this arithmetic hap action happening. There must be some really interesting things to say about this. It must be very creative, but unfortunately, it's just it's just zero. Um, it's completely contractible. Uh, so. Uh, that's your first indication. Maybe the, the, I, I bet the reason Peter wants me to say this also is that the that's one of your first indications that in fact the the raw homotopy type 
for something like spec sed isn't really enough to to recover the stuff that you really love about spec sed um, so by the way if you're wondering why this can be uh, I, I encourage you to think about the uh, example of the atoll fundamental group so what does the atoll fundamental group have to do with well it has to do with uh, taking covers of uh, spec Z. So what do those things correspond to? Well, those things correspond to field extensions, finite field extensions of Q, but those field extensions are uh, being asked to be unramified everywhere at every single prime. And there's a little theorem that says that there aren't any of those. So uh, that's why you end up saying that pi one of this has to be zero. And now the typical way that you see that the higher pi i's are all zero is that you use some kind of duality type statements, which is something I hope to talk about later on. But, uh, but in any case, this homotopy type is in fact contractible. Yeah, maybe let me also add that Tomer has a really nice uh, explanation of this on math overflow <laughs> for oh, okay. anyone who feels like reading this at some point. All right, see Tomer on math overflow. I can, I'll post the link to the chat. Cool. So if, if you are really interested in this, uh, he has a very nice explanation. Yeah, but it uses arithmetic duality, right? I think that's the only, only way I know to prove this is to, to really use arithmetic duality, um, which is something I want to get to. Any other questions? So uh, I'm messing up something about the functoriality of shapes in geometric morphisms of topoi. Can you just uh, briefly go over that? Sure. Um, so let's see. So, so uh, Jay is asking about what happens if I've got a geometric morphism, uh, say from X to Y. And he wants to know, well, what direction does the shape go in? Is that right, Jay? I want to make sure I'm not yeah, I was just uh, checking against uh, what you were telling us about a variety, a complex variety. Right, so it goes in the same direction. Right, so pi infinity uh, x will go in the same direction. Is that, is, does that generate a, a, a problem for you, Jay? For some reason, I was uh, thinking it went in the other. Can you just say why it goes covariantly? Yeah, so... Um, so absolutely. So uh, there are various ways to think about what this shape is. So let me let me give you one way, which is the way that we kind of, uh, I'm not sure if I fully said this yesterday, but let me, uh, or uh, last week, but let me, so remember that what we have here is that we're trying to understand the difference between your topos X and uh, the topos of spaces S. And so one way of thinking about what's happening here is that you've got this usual adjunction, right? So this is global sections, this is the constant sheaf. And what we're doing is we're kind of wrapping around that adjunction, right? We're looking at the, what happens when you go up and go back down. Um, that turns out to be the same thing as uh, a functor that doesn't quite exist going this way which is what you might call gamma lower shriek. Now this, this further left adjoint doesn't exist, but it sort of pro-exists. So this is a pro-existent left adjoint. And remember, what's the story here? The story here is that pi infinity of our x is the same thing uh, sorry, is the same thing as uh, gamma lower shriek of, uh, I don't know why I keep doing that, of the number, uh, of the point of the terminal object. Okay, maybe I can do this differently. Maybe it'll help if I do this differently. Uh, so uh, I have a pro object, which I'm getting by going like this and then like this. Right. Now this diagram, this part of the diagram just commutes, right? Are you with me? Yeah, yeah, I'm following. 
So this part of the diagram just commutes because it's just pushed forward. Right? So there's nothing happening here. So the question is, uh, what happens on the other side? Oops. What happens if I look at the constant sheaf and I push it forward and I look at the constant sheaf? And what you see is that, uh, well, uh, if I take the constant sheaf, uh, let me just say this correctly here. I can do this. The constant sheaf down to y, maybe I should emphasize which direction I'm going. The constant sheaf down to y admits a map to uh, f lower star of the constant sheaf down to x. Everybody happy with that? Adjoint to the identity, right? Adjoint to the identity. Everybody see that? So that map exists, right? And so now what does that, what impact does that have? Well, okay, so I've got this, I've got a natural transformation now from, let me, let me write this out carefully, from gamma uh, x lower star, sorry, it's not from that, it's to that, from gamma y uh, lower star, gamma y upper star, to gamma x lower star, gamma x upper star. So I've got a natural transformation going that way. Do you agree? Raise your hand if you agree. Hold, hold on a second. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, it's an upwards yeah. two, two cell on the left side, right? Is what you've just given us. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see, I'll draw that in. Another way of saying this is it's putting, uh, it's doing gamma y lower star, the unit of the adjunction for f lower star and f upper star, and then gamma y upper star. Yeah. Perfect. So, so the conclusion here is that shapes are contravariant for geometric morphisms. No, <laughs> because be careful about what direction the maps go. So, what does it mean to talk about? Okay, so, map so, of so I think that must have been my confusion that in pro the. Uh, the okay. The number of times that that's confused me is so high, you would not believe how many times that this has perplexed me. Remember that the category of pro spaces, I forget uh, every time, is the category of functors that are accessible and left exact from spaces to spaces op. And it has to be that because the UNATA embedding has to be a functor from spaces into that. Yeah. Right. This is something that has kept me up at night. I don't know how many times. I've screwed this up so many times. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you should just get a tattoo. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it would help a yeah, lot. Yeah, if, if you haven't screwed this up in your life, then you're like a robot or something. Like, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's just so confusing. <laughs> that that must I'm sorry. That was the sole point on which I I was actually confused. Uh, okay, I, so then you you already knew what the functoriality was. It was just the the definition. I, of the I, I forgot the opposite. Yes. In yeah. Category. It's it's really a, it's really annoying. It's a it's a it's an issue. David, um, you unmuted um, yourself. I feel like you're trying to say something. Oh, did I? I didn't mean to. Oh, okay. Oh, I was, I was going to comment on the handedness of the two cell, uh, but we already went over that. Okay. Uh, are you happy with what I wrote or? Yeah, totally. Okay, cool. Yeah. So this is, this is a key point. Thanks Jay for bringing it up. Yeah. The functoriality is, is if you think about these things as, as uh, functors and natural transformations between them, the, the functoriality feels backwards. But when you think about these things as pro spaces, it goes the right way around. So thanks, Jay. What other questions do we have here? I, 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 there's no reason to rush through any of this. So we, you know, we can all understand at the same speed. So maybe I have one more thing to ask about the uh, functoriality for your example of a variety. So if you think about complex Betty realization out of the, you know, complex motivic category. Yeah. You, um, so that makes me think that it goes from at all to analytic. So 
somehow, right? Uh, if, if you take pi, like take homotopy groups or something, like so, so complex motivic homotopy groups map to the homotopy groups of the Betty realization. But in, in that situation, right, isn't there only a functor in one direction, which is this Betty, like this Betty realization? And I mean, here you have, you have an, an adjunction, right? So there's functors in both directions, but. I, I was commenting on just the morphism going from the um, profinite completion of uh, XCN. This one. Yes, into, um, well, the atoll homotopy type. Which induces if you take pi i or something, yeah, uh, a, a natural map from the homotopy the, of the topological thing to the tall homotopy. Yes, that's right. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so that's right. So I can I can uh, I get this way a map from from pi i of this topological space into uh, the sort of a tall pi i. Yeah. Um, but if I think about uh, just thinking about taking complex Betty realization out of like the motivic uh, homotopy category, then it seems like um, I mean it's not the same. I mean, since math is consistent, it's it's not giving you exactly the same thing. But it seems like you're going from invariance of the algebra geometric thing to invariance of the you know Betty realization. Oh, I see. You're saying this is the opposite way. You're saying a realization I'm map. Talking about heuristically. I mean, yeah. Math, well, yeah, math checks out, but so so Jay, I think it's because like the uh, motivic thing just has a lot more information than the than the Atal thing, right? No, I think the opposite is true. Well, no, I mean, I'm saying it has built like somehow the Atal thing is already being profinitely completed. And you can't recover. You can't recover something that's like the original space from its profinite uh, completion. Uh, always somehow. So there's there's like something going on there. Yeah, I agree that I'm not profinely profinely completed uh, in the motivic setup. So there there might be some. Yeah, and the motivic homotopy type, like I've only ever seen the definition of motivic pi one, and it's like extremely intricate. Somehow it's not one of these uh, shapes, it's something else. Uh, I, I think that, I think that I would have to think carefully about the, what it, it means. So I, I, no, but I take Jay's point though. I mean, I think, uh, this isn't going to be quite right, Jay, but I'm going to say something and then I'm going to say that I have to think about it a little more to say something better. Um, so here's the thing I'm going to say, which is that I think that the, the realization functors are, uh, let me just say this correctly. Right, so what we're writing down here is absolutely not a realization functor in any sense. Um, it's, it's, it, it doesn't, it, it, it is in no way, um, it, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's of a very, very different kind, uh, than the typical realization functor that you'd, you'd, you're thinking about sort of taking a pi one motivic, which is supposed to be like the right thing. And then you're supposed to get out from this thing, some shadow of it, which you get by taking some kind of realization. Is that right? That's what I'm thinking about. And, and I think I think neither side matches up very well with the two sides that you started with. <laughs> so I think you shouldn't be too misled by that. This is just a different kind of thing. Uh, I mean, there is, you know, the, the Atal Pi one does uh, compare to the uh, Atal realization a bit, but e even that is an imperfect comparison. So I, I don't think, um, well, it, yeah. it was a moral statement, so I, I, I can only give you a moral answer, which is that you shouldn't think of pi one of the of x with its complex analytic topology as the right pi one either. 
um, like it, it only knows about what the topology can tell you, but it, it, you know, there's actually a lot more to a scheme than what the topology can tell you in general. Well, at least a priori. Sure, so that maybe, uh, maybe, maybe a different thing you can say is that uh, philosophically, like the motivic one, like lives over a family and it's kind of an inclusion of a fiber. This is why it's in the opposite direction. Well, uh, so what's the family that you have in mind, Tom? Uh, passable realizations. Oh, right. I see. Oh, right. I see. Yeah, I think I agree with that sentiment. Yeah. Anyway. Um, I'm going to leave that for now, if that's okay. Uh, I can try and give you a better answer later, if that's okay, Jay. That's fine. Um, so, uh, let's see, how are we doing on time? Okay, so we've got, uh, so Peter, are you okay to, uh, I'm not sure exactly what our schedule is going to be, but I, Yeah, I think, I'm okay to not talk today. That's, is that okay? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's completely fine. <laughs> I don't um, want to okay. preempt you. Peter's got some really, you've got really beautiful slides all prepared. It's, no, no, it, it's totally fine. <laughs> that they'll still be beautiful next week, everybody. Um, yeah, they'll still exist unless uh, all my <laughs> technology burns and well, and then Clark will still have them. So unless his computer explodes. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've got backups and stuff now. So it's great. Okay, so so I want to move away from this kind of we've been talking kind of non linearly. We've been talking about sort of raw homotopy types, sheaves of sets, sheaves of spaces, stuff like that. And now I want to move away from that and start talking about sheaves of linear things, sheaves of kind of linear structure lying around. So, uh, so uh, I'm just going to give you the general definition here. So we're going to let K be a field. It's going to be a base field for us. And we're going to talk about a K linear abelian tensor category. Uh, and we're going to say it's Tanakhian over K. Uh, if it has the following three properties. Uh, first, that it's rigid. So rigidity means that if you've got an object, then, uh, then you have a dual object, right? So it's just HOMs, it's the internal HOM into the unit. So in particular, that internal HOM should exist and it should behave the way that you would like it to behave. Um, so, so every object is dualizable in, in the good sense. Um, Next is a kind of connectedness hypothesis. This is, I should, I should have written down that this is connectedness. This is saying that if you look at the endomorphisms of the unit, that just has to agree with the field. You've always got a map, but that map needs to be an isomorphism. So that's like saying that, you know, H0 of your space is just the ground field, right? So it's a connectedness hypothesis. And then finally is this Kind of mysterious. This is the this is really where the Tanakhianness comes comes into uh, its own Tanaka. I'll just write Tanaka name. Um, this is where the Tanakhianness really comes into its own. It says that if you have some finite field extension, then uh, you always have uh, what's called a fiber functor from A into vect of the vector spaces over that uh, thing. And these are the finite dimensional vector spaces. And what does it mean to be a fiber functor? Well, uh, it means that this is a uh, exact functor and it's a tensor functor. Right? So it's a K linear exact tensor functor. So maybe I'll actually write that down. So K linear exact and symmetric monoidal. And so this is what it means to be a Tanakian category over a field K. So, um, yes. Lisa, sorry, you're you're not assuming that the functor is conservative, or something like that, for instance. Isn't that usually an assumption? Oh yes, you're right. Thank you. I'm sorry. Conservative. Yes. Thanks, Jay. Yes, absolutely. I want it to be conservative. I want it to detect equivalences. So if something goes to zero, I want that thing to be zero. That's the 
that's the rule. So this is what it means to be a Tanakian category over K. And so, you know, I, uh, I've been trying to figure out how to talk about this without kind of like getting too excited because I, uh, I grew up on Tanakian categories and it was, it was the reason that I started thinking about algebraic geometry in the first place. And then, you know, it was the reason that I started thinking about derived things. It was the whole reason I started thinking about homotopy theory. Like everything sort of came out of trying to understand Tanakian categories for me. So uh, I, I get way ahead of myself. Um, so I'm, you, you all should slow me down as much as you can. But, uh, you know, so, so this is a purely, what I want to emphasize here is that this is pure category theory. I mean, I've got a field in back of this thing, but this is an absolutely purely categorical sentence. Uh, what's in front of us is a compute, completely categorical notion. Um, I didn't write down all the coherences because I, I just didn't feel like it, but it's, it's, it really is just pure category theory. There's nothing else going on here. Um, but what's amazing is that when you think about this pure category theory, it basically forces uh, some actual algebra geometric concepts on you. So the thing I'm going to say now is that if you happen to have a Tanakian category, it's always representations of, well, if not an out, a, a affine group scheme, then it's representations of something that's slightly stackier, uh, a gerb, that's what it's called. Okay, so let's write that down. <clears throat> so if you have one of these guys, you have a Tanakian category, then what can you do? Well, uh, for, every, for every K algebra R, what you can do is you can associate to it uh, this thing that I'm going to call pi 1a of r. So this is pi 1 of the Tanakian category of r. And this is going to be fiber functors from a into projective modules over r. So these are uh, k linear tensor functors that are exact and conservative. Right? And so I can always contemplate this. And this is functorial in my, in my R. So as R varies, this thing is completely functorial and this thing is a gel. Hey, who knows what the word gel means? I always just assumed it meant gerbil. <laughs> There's no way it means gerbil, is there? <laughs> no, I was kidding. Oh. What does it mean? Does, does someone know? Can I someone think, tell me? I think it means a uh, sheaf of wheat, actually, in like some old French. Or I, I remember reading this at some point, and I was like, oh, this is weird. It's another word that just means sheaf as well. <laughs> I see. So it's another like 16th century agricultural thing. Well, that's growth in Detroit. But right? I also don't know any, I mean, I, I only understand French by knowing Spanish. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm prepared to believe it. I, I just, I, it occurred to me just now that I didn't know what that word meant. Uh, so. John Ugster says in German too. That, that it's a, it's, it's, it's a 18th century. And Google mean, Translate funny. agrees that it, it means sheaf also. In okay, great. So this is just yet another word for sheaf. Uh, that's ah. great, that's handy. Well, it is a sheaf. Uh, but what kind of sheaf is it? It's a sheaf of groupoids, and by groupoids here, I really mean one groupoids um, that is locally connected. So that means that that uh, you know, as you make your your uh, R bigger and bigger, you know, for some flat cover of your R, you're actually going to find something that uh, where it's non-empty, and then you'll eventually find where it's actually connected. So, so it's an exercise to show that this is actually really the case. Yeah. So what topology is this in with respect to? Oh, yeah, this is the flat topology. So you mean the word locally. Yeah, right. This is, this is with, uh, uh, say, well, Harry's here. So I can say the FPQC topology. So I just mean some flat covering. But in fact, you'll already see it for a finite extension of K itself. So already for K itself, you will find uh, 
uh, a fiber functor, you will find that there actually is one, right? That's indeed, that's condition. That's, that's number, a condition. Yeah, that's condition number three. Uh, but then after a further extension, if you have two of them, they're always will coincide after some further extension. That's the claim. So this is this local connectedness. Okay, so uh, the amazing theorem, and this is a theorem of a whole lot of people, uh, but uh, sort of most prominently, the person who got it right was Deleen uh, in 1990 in the Growth and Deep Fest Drift. So I've got a question yeah. about this. So in Deleen's version, he has this uh, sort of like super vector spaces thing going on. Yeah, and I'm not dealing with that right now. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I was just wondering. Yeah, I was so confused you, you when can, I read it. You can you can look at fancier fiber functors than the ones we're talking about right now. Um, so the issue is so so we'll we'll come back to this, but but uh, so there's a huge issue here, which is that number three, it's certainly a condition on your category, but it's not really clear what kind of condition it it is. It's a it's a it's not something that you're saying internally to your category A, right? It's saying that there exists a thing. And the question is, what conditions could you put on your A to guarantee that that thing exists? And uh, if uh, your field is of characteristic zero, then you can write down some conditions that will ensure that that thing exists. Um, if you uh, allow a target that is different from the category of vector spaces, but actually includes the category of vector, super vector spaces, then you can actually relax that condition in a serious way. Uh, and you can actually see that, that, you know, that really fiber functors are always available if you're willing to go to what are, salt, what are called super vector spaces. But I wasn't going to do that. I'm just going to work with or ordinary vector spaces for now. Um, but yeah, so there's there's a key issue here. I mean, this is this is where the this this condition here is a, 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 a difficult to achieve. Or more precisely, difficult to prove. Um, you'd like to be able to prove that just using stuff that you've got lying around inside A. And at least if your field is of characteristic zero and your A is very nice, then you can do that. But in general, this is, this is where the hard part is in some sense. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, right, let me just continue. So the, the, the uh, to continue listing names is what I mean to say. So this is built off of uh, the thesis, I guess, of Saavedra Rivano. Uh, I don't know what year off the top of my head. Does someone know? It's early. It's like 73 or something. 72. 72. Thanks, Peter. Um, and of course, you know, the, the original idea for all this, I mean, I think Savadra, Savadra Rivano was a, a student of Grothendieck. So Grothendieck was behind all this. Um, and, and this connectedness hypothesis was something that's missing from Savage Rivano's thesis and had to be introduced later by, uh, by Deligne. Uh, so this is, the, this is the basic theorem, which is that if you've got A, which satisfies this purely categorical hypothesis, right? It's a completely categorical formulation of what it means to be Tanakhian. Then that category is actually the category of representations of one of these shapes. That is to say, it's the category of vector bundles over this, this geometric object, this stack. Right? You should think of this stack here as like a BG, and you're looking at bundles over it, which is the same thing as representations of your G. That's the way you should think of this. So uh, and and so you've actually got not just an equivalence, but in this case, since we're not choosing points. Uh, it's actually a canonical equivalence. I don't know why I erased it. I meant to highlight it. There's actually a canonical equivalence between these two things. The category A is the category of representations of one of these shapes in a canonical fashion. Okay, so let's see this in action. So the first example has to be that we're going to be talking about uh, topological space X, in our case, usually a CW complex. 
And we're going to take that CW complex and we're going to look at local systems. Uh, we're going to look at local systems of that CW complex uh, valued in k vector spaces. So x will be a CW complex and we're going to look at local systems valued in, in uh, k vector spaces. And well, what happens? Well, what happens is that's a Tanakian category. In fact, it's a Tanakian category and you can, you can write down for yourself a fiber functor. If I've got a point, if I've got a point of my x, then I can always extract from that point a fiber functor. That fiber functor is often called omega sub x, and it goes uh, from uh, the category of local systems. So if I've got a local system on x with values in k, then I can produce a k vector space. And how can I produce that k vector space? Well, if I have my local system L, then I can just take the stock at, at that point x. And this is a perfectly good fiber functor attached to your point x. So am I supposed to think about this as a sort of abelian version of uh, covering space theory? Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so so in this case, though, instead of thinking about just uh, locally constant sheaves of sets, where you're looking at sections and you see kind of a discrete set of, of sections, you instead see a k vector space of sections. Right? So you can't expect a sheaf of sets out of this, you instead see a sheaf of k vector spaces. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that we have this this funny object here, this shell, this thing is a shell. And it's in some sense uh, a way of taking the, the fundamental groupoid of your CW complex and tensoring it up to K. And so this has a name, this is called uh, uh, the algebraic hull. of the fundamental groupoid of x. Maybe I should emphasize the role of the field here. It's the k algebraic call of this fundamental groupoid. Could you say what the types here are? Like is ls uh, of x colon k, is that a category? Yeah, that's a category. In fact, it's a Tanakian category. Uh-huh. And then assuming, of it? Assuming, that x, assuming that x is connected. Just to waste right. it. We must. Oh, yeah, thanks. For conservativity. Yeah, so the connectedness, thanks, Tomer. Yeah, so the connectedness actually comes in right here where, where I conveniently wrote the word connectedness. Item yeah. two. Yeah. What's that? Would you say, David? Oh, <laughs> nothing. Item okay. two. Um, yeah, so this, this connectedness here is, is the connectedness of our X. Um, thanks, Tomer. Yeah, that's right. So this is a Tanakian category if X is a connected CW complex. Thank you. Um, and uh, let's see, what other things do you want to, did you want type checked, Aaron? Um, so, and then pi, pi one of that category is this new definition that you just told us? Yeah, this is a jail right here. That's uh -huh. right. So it this evaluates on K algebras. Yeah, it's the gerb of fiber functors valued in proj R. So for each K algebra R, I can tell you what it means to be a fiber functor from A into the category proj R. Mm -hmm. And I'm just telling you, and as R varies, that gives me a pre sheaf. And in fact, it's a sheaf. It satisfies FPQC descent or whatever. And, uh, and it has this property. It has the property of being locally connected, this topology. And now what I'm telling you is that uh, that thing is a gerb, but I want to regard it as a kind of way of taking the fundamental groupoid of X and bringing it up to the level of uh, K-linearizing it. That's what I want to say. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah, so on the right-hand side, we have just a... A group, a groupoid. Yep. Uh, and then, and then this this symbol that I have not defined yet. 
<laughs> okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So this the is this product. is this is just um, this is intuition. <laughs> okay. Or if you like, this is the definition of the other side. Um, you you could say that this is exactly what that means. Okay. You felt, you know, brave. And I guess you could make it a functor, honestly, of groupoids in this fashion. Yeah, so I can make this, so down here, I've got an actual functor of groupoids from the pi one of this to the k points of this k gerb. Mm -hmm. right? So I can actually talk for any point of x, I can extract from it a fiber functor. And well, if I've got a path between these two points, then I'll have actually a path between the corresponding fiber functors. I'll have an equivalence between the corresponding fiber functors. That kind of follows from the sort of argument that I gave last time. Do you buy I, that? I, Yeah, I, I have a I have a remark that maybe is a little bit too technical. So let me know if it's too technical. I'm, I'm just gonna give the kind of tangent vector. Yeah. So, so saying that item two is the connectedness is, is somehow slightly imprecise because uh, the connectedness actually appears twice in your list. Uh, once is the conservativity of the fiber functor. Yeah and once as this mm -hmm. item two. And yeah. the, conserva the conservativity of the item of the fun fiber functor already tells you that this algebra and a the unit is local uh, with the residue field, which is an ex you know, which is essentially K. So, so really what this thing tells you is some kind of reducedness um, to his yeah, kind thanks. of this kind of reducedness, actually. Yeah, yeah, I have to absorb that point. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So, so that's something we don't see with, with, with plain homotopy types though, local systems, that's automatic. Is that right? Can say it again, can you say it again? This, this issue, it is the case, however, that for a local system, uh, local systems of ordinary vector spaces over oh, a space of CW complex, um, this is condition two will hold. If your space is connected. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry, if, if it's connected. Right, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that's right, thanks, Tomer. Yeah, that's right, there's two, two forms of, of, that's right. And that's actually, uh, this point actually is gonna be a non-trivial problem potentially for us uh, later in the semester, and I, I, I uh, uh, I might need some advice on how to address this issue at some point. Um, so it, it, in a second here, I'll, I'll state a conjecture, I'll state a, a question that I'm hoping that we're going to solve in the course of this. Uh, and, and you'll see that this, this business with the conservativity is in, it, you know, this fact that connectedness is in two disparate places. Uh, I'll want to see a resolution of that and I don't know how to do that yet. So, uh, but let me come back to that in a second. Uh, but thanks, Tomer. That's a that's a good point. I, oh, I, sorry, I had to step out for a second. That's okay. But I just want to comment to Aaron's point, and I think what Tomer was getting at. Uh, so, if, if for A to be K local systems on a CW complex X, yeah, then the the right hand side of item two is well, if we're doing it in one category, is, is H not? Uh, yes. Literally. Right, that's what I was trying to think through was if K was a derived, uh, you know, DG algebra, whatever, spectrum. Right. Right, so this but is it, all one category. That was this cool. is all just for one categories, yeah. Yeah. In the, sure. in the evident infinity version, it would be the cohomology of X for K. That's right. That's right, oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, on the left-hand side. On the left-hand side. Would be the, so the mapping space from X into the ring spectrum or whatever, into the community yep. rings. Okay, great, thanks. That fixes what I was worried about. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, no, so sorry, I, I should have said this is, I, I'm going back to one categories here. This is just a one category. Oh, no, I was, I was just jumping or guessing. Yeah. No, I mean, I think guessing is a good idea because it's, uh, I, I, there's a lot of guessing to be coming up here. Um, okay, so this is this, this idea of taking the algebraic hull of this thing. Uh, so we have a, a fundamental groupoid and we're going to try and fix it up by trying to take this algebraic hull. Let me actually emphasize that there are a lot of other examples of this kind of thinking um, that are that are really useful. I'm not, I mean, you know, there's no way for me to go through the entire list of different kinds of Tanaki and categories and their duels out there. I mean, there's a whole world of these things. Um, but I thought I'd give just one more example, which I kind of enjoy. So, uh, uh, so let's work over a field of characteristic zero. Um, and let's work with uh, a scheme that's smooth actually a variety, if you like, that's smooth and geometrically connected. So if you base change it up to the algebraic closure of K, then it's going to be a connected scheme. And I'm going to look uh, at the unipotent flat vector bundles. So these are the vector bundles of a flat connection. And these things are all, and I'm only going to look at the unipotent ones, so just the successive extensions of the trivial vector bundle again and again. Um, and so that's the that's the category that I'm going to work with. It's you know you'll realize I'm carving out quite a small category. Like these is a very tiny category of of uh, vector bundles. But nevertheless, I'm going to define this turns out to be a Tanakian category, and I can define what's called the pi one Duram attached to this thing. And this is sometimes called the the Duram Duram fundamental groupoid attached to this. And so this is so, a, yes. This U D R is this U uh, Nabla? Oh yeah, Nabla is what that's supposed to be. Um, I I was surprised to see unipotent there. Could you say again what that means? I just mean that it's it's uh, successive extensions of of the unit in this symmetric modal category. Oh, that, oh, that's an adjective on the vector bundle, not the flat connect. Okay. Yeah, right. It's, I see. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Yeah. It's a very small category. Um, it's very small. Um, nevertheless, it's, it actually knows a lot about the information. So if you want to read about this thing, uh, uh, let's see. I think I only know one. Someone else might be able to chime in here, but the only reference that I know for this right now is is uh, Deline's paper on um, on p one minus three points. Is there something else I should cite, Tomer? Uh, well, uh, two remarks. So, so first of all, isn't there? I think there's a paper by Deline Guncharov also, if I'm not wrong, about this. And um, I think it's also mentioned in some papers of freedom. Ah, that's uh, a good idea. Um, I just want to also remark that the, uh, the unipotent condition does involve the connection. It is not only a connection on the vector bundles. You need your, your, your right. metrics of derivation to, you really need a filtration in the world of vector bundles with connection. Yeah. That's, uh, this is a uh, quick remark to David's uh, yeah. question. Yeah, I, uh, it's, a, it's an adjective on flat vector bundles. Yeah, not yeah. On just not the, the flat connection uh, alone, kind of. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So I misunderstood your question. Yeah, yeah but yeah. That's... Oh, oh, I see. You're, you're saying what's the bracketing of, this, of these, these words that I've written here? Yeah, so the unipotentness. Sorry, maybe I'm late to the game here. I think I'm just realizing that you said something that's right. Sorry. Unipotentness refers to the flat vector bundles, right? So you take the entire category of flat vector bundles and then you look at the unipotent ones inside that, as it were. Is that, you have, okay, good. Uh, so I don't know which paper of Pridham this might be. Uh, there's the, um... I don't remember the titles, but it's the, I think it's first one about the Matzlev completion things. This is, I think this, right. is, this appears there. I, um,
Okay. I, I actually should read this myself. I'll, it's a note for me as much as for anybody else. Uh, but yeah, the, the, so anyway, so this, 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 this Duran fundamental group void, which uh, the way in which it compares to, uh, you know, if, if K is say the complex numbers, the way in which this compares to the original pi one is uh, some kind of completion procedure. Um, and that's what this Maslow completion that's being referred to is, is all about here. Um, okay, so, so uh, you know, it, this is supposed to be kind of a Durham type example. I mean, the, the things that you're supposed to think about is that, that in the world of, of uh, algebraic cohomology theories, you're supposed to think about the, the idea that- Clark, you, you're on 2% battery. Yeah. Is that upsetting you somehow? No, I'm saying if, if your iPad <laughs> dies, then it, you're just going to disconnect. Uh, and, and I'll, like still it, be, I'll still be on the computer in front of me here. Oh, yeah, okay. Fine, fine, right. fine. Uh, I, can't, I can't let Harry get so stressed out here. It's, uh, hang on one sec. He literally only has one second of battery life left. That's what he means. <laughs> Oh, I've got plenty. Dirk likes to live on the edge, you know. <laughs> Doesn't play safe. <laughs> Let's see. This will probably do the job. Feel better? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, I we, we only have a few minutes anyway. I guess we've got fifteen minutes or so. But um, the uh, well, now I can't remember what I was saying. Sorry. Oh, right. Okay. I know what I was saying. So, so the thing that you're supposed to imagine is the following. You're supposed to imagine that, that uh, you have attached to your X some kind of cohomology theory, right? And that cohomology theory is a priori valued, say, in some sort of vector spaces. So let's say this is what's called a they cohomology theory. So you have to, any algebraic variety, uh, uh, vector spaces uh, with certain kinds of coefficients. Now, uh, the point is that those vector spaces aren't just vector spaces. Those vector spaces are actually representations of a pro-algebraic group. And the key example of this is if you think about, for example, the Duran cohomology. Now, why did that happen? This is your fault, Harry. I have no idea. Let's see yeah. you open up a second copy of it. Well, uh, I don't know what's happened here. You know, everything was fine until I plugged this in and then and it all went wrong. <laughs> anyway, let me just talk for a second. Uh, so so uh, attached to this algebraic variety is uh, a representation, not just a, a, a vector space. So for example, if you think about the Durham cohomology, that Durham cohomology is a priori just a, 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 a cohomology attached to your space. It's just a vector space. But in fact, it's more than that. It's actually representations of a group of a, a, a fundamental group attached to your variety. And the way you construct that fundamental group is as the Tanaka dual to some, some category. So the most- uh, Is uh, that again for under a, connected, under a connectedness hypothesis on the variety? Otherwise it would be like a group void. Yeah, normally it's just okay. under a connectedness hypothesis. Although, I mean, yeah, I think the right thing to do is to pass to some group void thing. Uh, but I have the problem that I don't know how to separate the two kinds of connectedness that Tomer pointed out. Um, I'm sure there's something smart I could do, but I don't have it at my disposal. Um, but the thing I wanted to say is that there's a, a standard example of this. My iPad is now dead, thanks to Harry. Um, but let me uh, say that the... Uh, um, no, I really am going to blame you, Harry. Um, the... Uh, uh, the the standard example of this is Hodge theory. So, so in the case of Hodge theory, what happens is that you look at the category of mixed Hodge structures and the category of mixed Hodge structures is actually the category of representations for a certain group. And that group is actually just the V restriction of GM um, along the map from you know, R to C. And that's uh, actually equivalent to the category of, of uh, mixed Hodge structures over R. So what that means is that when you start to talk about the cohomology of your varieties, and when you say, oh, it has a mixed Hodge structure, you're actually talking about it being a representation, 
for a certain kind of group. And that's the story. Um, so, uh, so if you take that point of view seriously, then you can't possibly want to stop at the level of just thinking about representations of a pro-algebraic group. That won't be sufficient for you because you know that the cohomology isn't just valued in vector spaces, it's valued in chain complexes. So you want to see representations potentially of something more exciting than just a pro-algebraic group. Uh, and so now's the part where I wanted to You know, everything was fine, and then Harry. All right, I'll have to leave this. Um, so, so uh, the uh, uh, representations of a pro-algebraic group uh, perhaps aren't sufficient. So then that leads you to what's called higher Tadakian duality. And I'm just gonna have to say this in words, and then we're gonna have to come back to it later. But uh, let me just say the following things. So there's a form of higher Tadakian duality uh, that you might look for where you say, all right, well, I'm going to talk about, instead of a, an abelian category, I'm going to talk about a, a, a stable infinity category of some description. And now that stable infinity category uh, should correspond to representations of something more elaborate. Um, that more elaborate thing would be a, uh, it, 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 well, in any case, it would at least be sheaves uh, say, uh, uh, perfect complexes over a derived scheme, right? That would be the ideal generalization of this. So then the idea is that, well, you want to try to understand the extent to which if you look at a derived scheme and you attach to it its category of perfect complexes, to what extent is that fully faithful, right? So that you can recover the original derived scheme. And then what is the essential image? So the first sentence I claim has been completely solved. That's actually well established by work of a whole lot of different people. Um, so uh, Jacob Lurie has a really nice summary of this in, in SAG. Uh, but the second part, the second part has to do with the fact that if you've got a, uh, if you've got a suitable stable infinity category, under what circumstances is it the perfect complexes over some derived scheme? And the answer to that, I think, is still, I don't think there are satisfactory conditions for that yet. I think that's an open problem. Um, there are some things that will guarantee that you get a scheme of a very particular kind, but there's nothing quite, uh, quite general as far as I know. I'm prepared to be contradicted by an expert who's here. No, okay. Uh, not yet. Maybe. I mean, maybe we should also mention this. I mean, in, to add to the list of the many, many, many people. Um, I mean, there, there's a very nice paper of James Walbridge. Uh, yes. He's yes. one of the many, of course, like the Toen is on this list. And uh, I mean, you know the people much better than I do. Yeah, but, so the, the and so yeah, right. Let me tell you the, the some of the history of this. So the idea that there's a higher Tanakhian duality, I think has been around for some time. I mean, I think Deline was aware of this, this idea. Uh, the first time I'd ever seen it written down carefully was uh, in a paper of Toen from about 2000. Um, and uh, he writes down a pretty precise conjecture about how this should go. But the problem is the following. So when you looked at the definition of a Tanakhian category, you could try and imagine taking those descriptions of things and just turning them into infinity categorical versions of the same thing without too much trouble. But as soon as you pass to the stable realm, there's one extra thing that you need, or it appears that you need, which is the presence of a T-structure. Uh, so it appears to be the case that the T-structure is absolutely necessary to make sense of this. So more precisely, what I mean is that if you look at uh, uh, a certain class of derived stacks, then, and you look at the functor that attaches to any of them, the category of, uh, let's say, quasi-coherent sheaves. And now I'm speaking infinity categorically, so I mean complexes of quasi-coherent sheaves. Then that functor only picks up the things that preserve connected objects, right, or connective objects, right? You, you don't get things that, that allow 
uh, shifts in this weird direction. Those things aren't part of what you get in the essential image of that functor. So that means if you're going to have a reconstruction, that reconstruction must involve that T structure in some non-trivial way. So this is under the assumption that your notion of a derived stack is locally modeled on connective infinity rings, right? This is That's right. Otherwise, you can't even make sense of what the T structure means. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for something that's truly non-connective, as far as I know, it's a completely open story. Um, I mean, unless someone has some theorem that they'd like to announce now. Uh, uh, I think uh, I think I think for non-connective things, I think it's a completely open book. Uh, so I have no idea what to say about that. So that's right. So when I say derived stack, I mean stack uh, that is locally modeled on a connective E infinity ring spectrum. And what I'm saying is that that a, uh, what you'd like to do is you'd like to understand what the essential image of that functor is, the functor that carries. Uh, derived stacks to stable infinity categories with a symmetric noise structure satisfying other things. But it appears that you actually have to add more structure, which is that of a T structure in this case. And so the question that I, uh, uh, so, so, there, there, so I think there's one question, which is what is the essential image of that functor? It's fully faithful in nice cases if you're prepared to do some work. Um, and that's what uh, Lurie and uh, Wallbridge, and uh, is it Isamu, Peter? I think I think so. I think that's uh, yeah. Wait, actually, I think I have this paper conveniently opened. I think it's uh, uh, Fukuyama and I Isamu Iwanari. Yeah, Iwanari, Hiroshi Fukuyami right. and Isamu Iwanari. That's it's right. called monoidal infinity category of complexes from a Tanakian viewpoint. Nice. Um, yeah, and I think if I remember correctly, this uh, Isamu Iwanari has like a bunch of Tanakian stuff on his website. Um, yeah, I mean, I think he's he's yeah. really he's really one of the inventors of this higher Tanakian point of view. Oh uh, yeah, I think he's he's he, he and Walbridge, I think, were one of the ones who or, or two of the people who really you know, got this story correct at some stage. Yeah, so actually, I mean, maybe maybe for the for the room, um, he has a pretty nice set of uh, notes, I think, or like a sort of introduction to this sort of Tanaka duality for stable infinity categories on his website. But mm -hmm. I think if I remember correctly, there's a ton of stuff on his website that is not um, not on the archive. So, oh, um, really? or at, at least he doesn't know. link it on the archive. And if I remember when I looked, uh, uh, oh, okay, maybe maybe this is on the archive. Ah, oh, this is actually even published. Okay, so in the Journal of Topology. So okay, I I was just complete uh, didn't remember correctly. But yeah, he has a ton of stuff about this sort of thing on his website that's all really nice. That's really cool. Um, and so, so right, so Walbridge, Iwanari, um, and Toen, of course, and then of course in, uh, in Lurie's uh, uh, SAG, there's a lot of descriptions of this. Uh, or sorry, a lot of special cases of this, uh, including one that is uh, actually a theorem of Bot and uh, Halpern Leister, um, which is uh, uh, quite a good characterization of a certain certain form of Tanaki duality. But again, the, the idea is always the same. You're sort of adjusting the kinds of geometric objects you're willing to contemplate, and on this side, you adjust the kinds of categories you're willing to work with. So there's stable infinity categories with a symmetric nodal structure, often also a T structure, and you kind of try and balance these two sides out. So here's the problem that I have no idea how to address. Um, so let me, let me end with this question. Um, so the question is gonna be, what is the stratified form of Tanakian duality or higher Tanakian duality? So uh, what we're gonna be doing, and, and I mean, you know, the, this question will get colored in quite a lot with Peter's talk, but the, you know, we've been telling the story about, you know, 
Galoisian duality, which is this sort of kind of duality that's a non-linear thing. And then we linear linearized it to get to the Tanakian level. And the same procedure should be happening in the world of the stratified thing, of, of stratified homotopy types. But so far, we only have the Galoisian part of the story correct. And so the question is, how do we fill in that other box? And uh, I think there's a lot of open questions that are sub subsets of that question. Um, for example, uh, in the Durham example that I gave there, I talked about uh, uh, vector bundles with uh, a flat connection. And then you look at sort of just the unipotent part of that to start with. But you can easily imagine a version of this where you're looking instead at things like D modules and holonomic D modules, for example. And you can imagine that corresponding to that should be something, but that something will no longer just be a sort of raw homotopy type. It'll be something more exotic. And the kinds of exotic things that I'm hoping that you'll get are the kinds of things that we'll, I guess, see next time, if that's okay with you, Peter. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. Uh... So I'm sorry to have run long. That, that sounds oh, cool. No, no. I, I like that uh, that near-term goal to get to opening up those questions. Yeah. So so I've got a dumb question. So so building T structures is hard, right? I mean, yes. right? So is this maybe motivation for trying to look at the non-connective model? I mean, I know that, I mean, that's sort of something that I've, been interested in for a long time? And I don't know, would that actually help if you had a sort of non-connective SAG or no? So, uh, yeah, so maybe I should say, and so, so there, there is a non-connective story. Um, it's just not known to produce anything geometric. Um, so Pridham, for example, has a, uh, a non-connective form of Tanakian duality. And, uh, and, but what he reconstructs is a certain kind of co-algebra. Mm. Uh, so the question is, you know, in what sense is that co-algebra got some sort of geometric content? Um, and I just don't know the answer to that question. I have no idea. Um, mm. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know whether it's motivation to look for something non-connective or whether it's, uh, or whether you should interpret that as motivation to stay only with things that have T structures. I, I don't know which is the right. <laughs> well, I mean, to take. I mean, so like, isn't one of these big questions and sort of like the theory of motives, right? Like you want to construct precisely sort of a T structure in order to get this sort of Tanakian uh, duality thing that you want, but for motives, right? So, so then that's like a super hard question. Well, but it, okay, so but there's there's two aspects to that question. One is just the question of whether or not you can build a T structure. That a T structure is very available to you. There's no problem. Yeah, with yeah, that. yeah. Um, but the question is whether you can build one that is actually the derived category of its heart. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's the question of whether or not there exists in various cases an abelian category of motives. Mm -hmm. And so that's really about uh, two things. Well, okay, so really what that's about is about whether or not the motivic Galois group is actually just a group or whether it's something more elaborate. Um, mm. But you see the, the I mean, it, you, you might have a perfectly good T structure, but the, the category isn't the, ca the derived category of any abelian category. That could happen. Okay, so yeah, for various forms of cat, for forms of motives, that that is what happens, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, you could just take the homotopy structure or something, then you get the wrong thing. You get the you don't get it. Yeah. Well, it's 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 wrong-ish, right? I mean, you know, it's it's wrong in the sense that the uh, that we don't know that it's right with rational coefficients. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe it's okay ultimately, but uh, yeah. So I don't know. I, I don't have a view exactly on whether or not it's worth it to try and pursue the non-connective form of this. 
Um, I don't really understand how non-connective non derived algebraic geometry should even work. Um, so I, I, I kind of don't want to, I don't want to represent that point of view. Uh, mm -hmm. What I would like to do though is represent the idea that the stratified form of this, whatever it is, uh, uh, is something is a well-motivated problem. Um, and that's the thing that we're going to start to unpack. Starting with Peter. Yeah, so, yeah, I think the, the plan for next week um, is to give a sort of uh, overview of um, stratified, you know, homotopy theory from sort of starting from uh, the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. So there will be lots of topological spaces and pictures. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, so that's all I had to say. Uh, I don't know. Is there anything else? Are there any other questions or anything that I can answer without the help of an iPad now that Harry's destroyed mine? Um, maybe, maybe I have a kind of a simple question. So, so, um, so when you're talking about this, um, you know, stratified version of a Tanakian category. Yeah. So is the kind of thing you're thinking of is something like a sheaf of the collage object instead of sheaf of group weight? Is that the kind of the idea that, that Yeah, so, uh, right. I think that's right. I think uh, at, at a, as a first approximation, I think that's right. I think that the, the thing we should be expecting is as a uh, sheaf of categories uh, satisfying certain properties. <laughs> um, but how actually you control the stratifications is not completely clear to me. Um, yeah, no, like, so let's say for a fixed, for a fixed certification. So kind of a sheaf of a decollage is on, on yeah. a given post. -it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if you want to fix a stratification, that's exactly right. Uh, okay. My fear is that uh, fixing a, at least a finite stratification is uh, not going to give you enough to see the examples that I'd like to capture. Things like, you know, holonomic D modules on a variety or something like that. I think we can't get away with a fixed strata, fixed finite stratification in that case. Um, but, you know, modulo that issue. Yes, that's exactly what I'm after. I see. Okay. Thanks. I, I mean, so if you do something stupid, I guess, so, so you have, uh, you, you want to define for each sort of constructible stratification, I guess, of your of of your scheme or something. Uh, you just you just do exactly what Tomer said. Like, is that not going to be a useful idea? No, it could well be a useful idea. I just don't know the theorem yet. Oh, okay, okay. I think it's a great idea. I just don't know how to prove anything. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. No, I mean, I, I think that's it, it, and I mean, you know. I think that's our goal ultimately once we understand how how stratifications work. But you know. Um, All right. Yeah, I don't know. I think there's I think you know, so I think part of the question is 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 it the case that this sort of stratified form of Tanakian duality, whatever it is, can we design it in such a way that it's as useful for general Tanakian duality as uh, the stratified atoll homotopy type is useful for the usual atoll homotopy type. So that part of that motivation of the story, I think, has to come after we've learned what the stratified atoll homotopy type is. Um, but, yeah. So, okay, maybe I can say something a little better than what I just said. So, so in the stratified at all story, one of the points is that uh, you simplify 
you know, I described this atal homotopy type, which was very abstract. Uh, and one of the sort of surprises is that it's actually just the nerve of a category. And by category, I really mean one category. And so, so it's a much simpler story than you might have thought was possible. And so the question is, can you, can you expect to have a similar understanding of various interesting Tanakian categories by introducing stratifications? That's maybe the better way to say what I was trying to say. So in the Tanakian story, you also have this, these connectedness assumptions, right? Yeah. Um, and so isn't that also going to get in, t in the way sort of? Absolutely. Yeah. Like, like you want to, you want like a Tanaki and homotopy type before you want, before you can talk about the stratified version, maybe? I don't know. Yep, strongly agree. Do it all. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I only know how to deal with a part of that, I think. Because um, mm -hmm. I think the issue is, is that I still don't understand. That's, that's what, what, you know, when we talk about this sort of Tanaki, higher Tanaki duality without introducing the stratifications, I still don't know what the essential image of that functor is. Right. Uh, I know that you have a, a fully faithful functor from perfect stacks into uh, symmetric monoidal stable infinity categories equipped with a T structure. But I don't understand the essential image of that functor. Sorry, is that exactly the adjectives or is it like co or like presentable and left adjoint functor? Or yeah, so I didn't say what the maps were, but yes, presentable is part of it, and uh, the maps have to preserve uh, uh, all co-limits, the symmetric monoidal structure, and the connective objects. Okay, great. And if you and, that, and that's literally stacks, true for for perfect stacks. Yep, that's literally true. Great. That's Thank a you. theorem. Um, so wait, but things in that case won't be they won't be like rigid, right? Or do you yeah, then, like just the perfect objects or perfect complexes will be? They won't be rigid, no. I mean, the, the perfect complexes will be rigid, yeah. Absolutely. Right, yeah. The yeah. general thing won't be, of course. Okay, okay. But the problem is, is that these things, I mean, so these things have the property that they're generated by their perfect objects. These things will all have that property. That okay, all right, yeah. But yeah, that would, you still uh, don't know what the maps are because the maps have to preserve the connective objects and connectivity and perfection don't play well with each other. Mm -hmm. um, so saying that, you know, so you've got a functor between, you know, you've got a co-limit preserving uh, functor, symmetric monoidal functor between these things. And you want to find out uh, whether it came from a morphism of stacks. Well, what you have to check is you have to check that it preserves connective objects. And I don't know how to read that off from what you have on perf alone. As far as I can tell, you have to have the entire category of uh, quasi-coherent sheaves. Uh -huh. But won't, won't uh, it always arise from something like that because of whatever this Gabriel Ulmer duality or whatever, or, or no? I'm not sure if I know what you're asking. Uh, so, so like you, if you have a, I forget, the, like if you have a presentable category, uh, and you look at uh, finitary, um, if you have, a, you look at the category of presentable categories with with finitary functors between them or something like that, uh, then uh, it's equivalent to uh, the category of um, uh, idempotent complete a uh, small infinity category, something like that. And the, the fun, one, one way you take end and the other one you take compact objects. Mm -hmm. And right. how does that interact with T structures? Is that the question? That's yeah, the question. yeah. Are you, are you requiring that all of your functors do come from the, at least the, uh, the compact objects plus yeah. additional data? That's okay. true, but the additional data is hard to read from just the level of the compact. Oh, objects. okay, okay, okay. So I'm saying that the, that the additional data has to do with preserving the connected part of the T structure. But that connected part of that T structure, I don't know how to read that off of just the compact objects. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think we have any idea. 
Um, so that there's Wait, an issue they, there. So. These are the pullback functors, right? They don't pr generally preserve compactness, do they? Oh, I'm, well, oh, sorry, no, this is the pull, uh, sorry, these, these are the pullback functors. It's contravariant equivalents. Yeah, yeah. And they do preserve compact objects. Yeah, they preserve that these are the dualizable objects in this case as well, compact and dualizable are the right. same. So the fact that okay. it's symmetric monoidal automatically implies that it will preserve the dualizable guys. Okay. Um, so, but, but uh, yeah, but the frustrating part is that that doesn't really help with understanding how it interacts with the T structure. <laughs> Well, does it suffice to check that on um, just on perf? Nope. Oh. Uh, At least not as far as I so, know. So why don't why don't you get any kind of like um, int co versus quasi co problems in these contexts, like compact objects versus their? Why why does those kind of issues don't appear? I don't know what, what's the question. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, there's you know there's just this kind of a um, there's two two big categories of coherent you know big coherent stuff you can attach. One is the incoherent chiefs, which you know it's essentially, um, and the one is the qu quasi coherent chiefs, mm -hmm. right? You're attaching the quasi coherent chiefs. Yeah, and I was trying. To, I was just trying to think if why is this distinction not a problem in this in this context? Um, I'm, 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 oh, I see. Because your notion of perfect is just being a compact quasi current chief. That's what you mean by perfect. Yeah, I think in this case the the two coincide. So, so you know, classically saying the two coincides is is this form of smoothness. Well, so saying that so saying that uh, perfect complexes and coherent or pseudo coherent complexes are the same is is something that you get out of regularity or something like that. Yeah. Um, but that's not uh, we're not saying that we're not ever really talking about the coherent objects at all. I see you. You're you're looking at like compact objects in quasi coherent things. That's and right. You never yeah. worry. Yeah, okay, we never even that, think about that. the coherent guys. Yeah, that's right. Okay, got that's it. Right. That's that's what's confusing. Um, although you highlight a good point, which is that um, I don't have a formulation for this yet, but there's this. No, nope, this is too vague to say out loud. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I'll have to think about this. I, I, let me come back to that. Um, yeah, there's, you know, there's this way in which pseudo coherent things are, uh, you know, almost almost perfect complexes are better. Or they interact better with the T structure, right? That's a that's a thing. So maybe that's something that you're saying I should be taking into account here. Um, I don't know how to do that yet. Tomer just vanished, so maybe I don't have to answer the question. I still see him. Oh, oh no, he's frozen. Anyway, uh, okay. Uh, I hope I haven't repelled too many people by being kind of sloppy at the end here. I, I, uh, I, my notes just failed me, so I have to. Everybody should come back in droves for Peter's talk. Will do. All right. Thanks. Thanks for uh, the talk. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. Let's talk, talk. soon. Bye, everybody.